Ladies and gentlemen, hello, my name is Peter Hrustov and today I will be talking to you about my PhD in computational topology for scientific visualization. Now, here is a brief outline of my presentation. First, I will tell you about some of the issues with visualizing large scientific datasets. And then I will introduce some of the topological methods I use to analyze those datasets. Then I will demonstrate to you an application I have built in collaboration with atmosphere scientists from the University of Leeds. And then I will discuss my future plans for the rest of my PhD. Now, scientists from the University of Pennsylvania in 2006 have made a study where they have roughly estimated that the bandwidth of the human eye, that is the amount of information it can process, in a single second is about one megabyte. Now, this is already a pretty big problem because as you know, data sets are growing bigger and bigger. Now, let's see how much of a problem it is exactly. Using this rough formula, we can estimate that it would take about 16 minutes for a person to process a gigabyte, that is a thousand megabytes. And 16 minutes is about 16 minutes from movie per gigabyte for average quality. So that's about right. But that also means that this is 277 hours for a terabyte. That's a thousand gigabytes. And then that's 31 years for a petabyte and three millennia for an exabyte. And the key issue is that current research in the United States computing labs, as well as in Europe and China, so that current research is currently going to exascale people, building supercomputers to handle and produce exascale data. For example, physical simulations of the weather or proton interactions or scientific experiments like that. And the problem is our, our tools for analyzing and visualizing data ready. So let's take a brief step back. Let's talk about how we make sense of data. Well, what is data? Very, very roughly, data is just a large array of numbers, ones and zeros, nothing else. And the key issue there is that no one will ever just sit down and look at that. Sorry, no one will just sit down and look at vast arrays of numbers. No one can make sense of that, especially in bigger data scales. So here's an idea. Instead of looking at the numbers directly, how about we split the data into regions and then visualize the connections between those regions? That is how the regions are related. The key question in, in doing this approach will be one, how to identify these regions, two, how to identify the relationships between them, and then of course, how do we extract and visualize those regions and relations and present them to scientists so they can understand what is happening in the data they produce. Now, here is a sample data set. This is a topographic map of the Yorkshire Dales. These are two hills, Green Hill and Great Combe. In a topographic map, we see these lines. And we see these lines, which are called contours. And these lines represent the points of data which have equal elevation. And that is the uniformity criteria specified. And if we separate our data into these lines called contours, we can start to abstract what's happening here. Now, what is important and clear in this data set? That we have two hills, and furthermore, that these hills join together as we lower the elevation at which we look. Now, what happens if we connect the hills? If we put a point at two of the hills and connect them, we see that the two connect at another point, which is called the saddle, and then beyond the saddle, all contours have a single connected component. Above that saddle, the contours have two connected components. And this is because some of the contours, from some of the contours, if you go up, you can only reach one of the peaks. And from some of the other contours, if you only go up, you can reach the other peak. At the saddle, however, you can reach both peaks. Now, if we do this, if we draw these vertices and this line, we can create an abstract representation of a dataset called a reef graph. 
Now, instead of having the whole image, which is made of a number of pixels, each pixel which represents the height, that could be a few hundred by a few hundred pixels, we've abstracted it to just a few items. Those are the four vertices and the three edges. And they give us the idea of the topological structures that happen in the data. And this is the core idea of the tools I wish to develop. I wish to develop tools which leverage topology and geometry to take massive data sets and reduce them to simpler representations that people can look at and understand. Now, here are some applications that people have found for weave graphs throughout the years. In computer graphics, they have been, they have been used to compare and understand 3D shapes and predict protein interaction. In molecular biology, they have been used to study breast cancer and identify ones with excellent survival rates. In neuroscience, they have been used to visualize and understand whole brain activity maps. I, on the other hand, would like to apply these tools to atmospheric science. And in particular, I would like to apply them to the problem of convective cloud formation. That is how clouds are formed. It may surprise you to learn that scientists don't have a full enough understanding of how clouds are formed in the atmosphere and clouds play a vital role in regulating our climate and weather so understanding that is extremely important now what we do know is that clouds oh, sorry cloud formation is regulated by three physical quantities these are temperature water ratio vertical velocity in simple term if a hot pocket of moist air rises above the point of condensation, it will condense and it become a visible cloud. The issue, however, is understanding which parts of the air in the boundary layer of the atmosphere go on to produce clouds. And this is a difficult problem because above the cloud base, that is above the point which clouds form, we can see the clouds and we can analyze the shapes and understand them. But below the cloud layer, the air is transparent and we cannot see anything. And if we can visualize those, scientists call them coherent cloud trickling structures, we can understand how they rise from, rise from the surface, merge with one another, and go on to become clouds. The way scientists study this is that they run simulations. And in these simulations, they insert these tracer gases which are much like inserting dye in a stream of water, just so you can see where it goes. In the collaboration with these scientists, I have developed an application that visualizes these cloud coherent structures and helps them to analyze their shape and understand their physical properties. Now, what you see in this image is a screenshot from the application. You can see a bounding box, which bounds a rectangle, or oh, sorry, not not a rectangle, but a bounding box in three dimensions. In this bounding box, they produce a simulation, and the bounding box sits between the atmosphere, oh, sorry, between the ocean surface and the cloud base layer. That is where the air is transparent. And we have visualized those coherent structures we just talked about. And the way we visualize them, in the same way we visualized contours in 2D. But contours in 2D are one-dimensional curves and contours in 3D are two-dimensional surfaces, which is why we leverage tools from computer graphics to visualize them. Now, in addition to visualizing them, we have also used the contour tree to color them and to pick out which ones are more important than others. Then, scientists can take those and understand their shape and analyze their physical properties. Now, what I would like to do further with my research is to go beyond the case of the Reeve graph. Because one of the limitations of the Reeve graph is that it can only be used for one variable at a time. But as we just saw in the atmosphere, we have three very key variables. Those are temperature, water ratio, and vertical velocity. And if we want to have pairs of variables, if we want to use two variables, our Reeve graph mathematically becomes a 2D surface instead of a 1D a 1D thing made of multiple lines called a graph. Now, the problem with having a 2D surface is one, figuring out how to compute it efficiently. 
covered there with some scan computed, but not efficiently enough to handle large scale data sets. Sorry. The second problem is how do we visualize this, this reef space? And I believe two strong computer graphics that handle triangles of meshes and figuring out how to visualize them are things I can leverage in my research because what I need to do is compute such a thing and figure out a way to visualize it for scientists so that they can understand what is happening. And then, of course, the final problem is how do we apply it to real world problems? And I would like to apply it in the ways I've outlined so far. And now, finally, I would like to tell you how I plan to spend the bursary should I receive it. Uh, the, three main th the main thing I would spend it on is traveling. Traveling to conferences or workshops or summer schools, or in particular traveling to meet some of my collaborators from the German Climate Computing Center and the Los Alamos National Laboratory. Well, thank you for your attention. Bye.